Gdansk is known both for its magnificent architecture and its canals, which reflect the richness of Central Europe's cultural heritage. A powerful commercial hub in the past, Gdansk has also played a significant role in the turbulent history of the 20th century. Here began the Second World War, but the city also had a key role to play in the fall of communism. The shipyards in Gdansk have emerged as a symbolic location concerning the 1980s democratic movements which swept across Central Europe. They saw the birth of Solidarity, an independent and self-governing trade union. However, the Gdansk shipyards are not the only symbols of the revolution of 1989. Other locations across Central Europe also played a significant part in the autumn of nations. Indeed, the same may be said for Wenceslas Square in Prague, the Hungarian-Austrian border, or the Berlin Wall. In 1989, civic movements developed throughout Central Europe and led to both political and economic transitions, which allowed the future integration of the region into the European Union. However, 1989 is mainly about people, their strength and drive for a better tomorrow. Some of the witnesses and active participants of that time give us a glimpse of what it was like in 1989, how these changes led to the enlargement of the European Union in 2004, and how it influences today's Europe and the world. 1989, the most important year of the transition, the Annus Mirabilis, the year of miracles. Really, that was a fantastic year, but every day brought something new, something uh, prosperous, something very important uh, to us. What happened after the regime change, as we call it in Hungary, it was really a successful period for the country and for the whole region of Central Europe, both for Poland, Hungary and the other countries uh, in the close to us, uh, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the East Germans and so on, and even in Southeastern Europe on the Balkans. So whatever happened later on and whatever people say and might have lost their so-called illusions, this change was uh, a wonderful experience for many of us. First of all, who participated in the events, but also for those who simply uh, enjoyed the benefits of political freedom and uh, the market economy later on. 1989, the Velvet Revolution showed uh, that uh, uh, there is an end to any and every totalitarian regime uh, if you have a clear vision, if you have leaders that are able to really guide uh, the masses, if you have uh, the political and human courage, and uh, if you have the ability to take these decisions. And I think that uh, this is an important lesson, not just to us, but to people in Cuba, in Iran, or in any other state in the world, uh, which uh, uh, unfortunately uh, does uh, uh, basically apply totalitarian uh, practices on, the, on its own population. I think the most important lesson from that time in the end of the 80s is that it's the lesson to understand you can change things. Nothing has to remain as it is and you are able, together with others, to change things, to change your own society and much more than that, together in a community with others, you are able to change things to get better. Revolutions, when they come, they do so unexpectedly. You cannot predict in advance when will the tipping point come. You never know which stone, when turned, will release an avalanche. If you look at the year 1989, uh, one month ahead uh, of the crumbling down of the Berlin Wall, no one was expecting uh, what eventually came. Everybody was expecting uh, a slow, gradual decay of the regime in East Germany. One month ahead of the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, those who knew the country were overall expecting a long, drawn-out process of decay process of gradual adaptation to the change elsewhere in Europe, but generally continuity of the regime. 
one month ahead of uh, the bloody events uh, in December 89 in Romania and the toppling of Romanian dictator Ceausescu, those who knew the country were all expecting uh, that this country would continue its own authoritarian ways uh, for some indeterminate uh, future. And yet, revolutions came throughout the eastern half of the continent. So the, what is the lesson? The lesson is to be prepared. The lesson is to organize yourselves. The lesson is uh, to work at the grassroots level. The worst lesson is to think ahead and uh, imagine your country uh, when it uh, <clears throat> Uh, goes the way of democracy, the way of the market economy. That's the lesson for all those who still suffer under the authoritarian, undemocratic regimes, and we have a few of them still, unfortunately, also in Europe. Freedom is not a given. It should not be taken for granted. It has to be fought for. It comes at a price, sometimes a great personal price, and we should not assume it is there to stay forever without us as citizens, as people doing no nothing, enjoying our lives and just sitting and watching the world. It has to be watched. The politicians have to be watched because what can happen is that it, freedom ebbs and flows. So we should take care of it and be vigilant. The 90s were not easy. Democratic and economic transitions required a lot of patience and resilience from Central European societies. Such economic transitions impacted heavily the daily lives of citizens, sometimes negatively. We are standing in front of the European Centre of Solidarity, which was opened in 2014 and is a symbol of European integration. Today, European Union membership is something natural and obvious for many young Europeans. However, we should not forget that this process was most demanding. Without doubt, the reunification of Germany in 1990 and the commitment of Germany to the European integration of Central Europe facilitated considerably the accession process for the region. Nevertheless, European integration remains a perpetual process and a daily struggle with both its successes and failures. Germany, Wilhelm Kobe, played an important role to convince the other European states to integrate with new democracies, to make clear that it is structural the right of new democracies to get members. And so I think that Germany in the 90s played an important role in that way of integration. And I'm happy about that we in East Germany not just succeeded in democracy, but also in unification and the enlargement of Europe, shaping together a new Europe, which hopefully is a basis for good welfare, freedom, not only for us in Europe, but also for our neighbors and to play a good role in the world. European Union uh, was for me always a value community. It's not about the money and not about the financial advantages and financial benefits. For me, it's, it's much more about values, uh, norms and standards. I think that the, probably the key success uh, for Europe's enlargement uh, in 2004 is that we at Poland felt that we are coming back to where we belonged, but for political reasons, for the uh, for reasons of Europe being divided into between uh, between two uh, political blocks, we could not enjoy. Well, the enlargement of 2004 brought an unprecedented uh, acceleration of economic growth. Uh, catching up uh, the eastern part of the continent uh, with Western Europe, uh, rise in living standards and the overall uh, increase of well-being uh, in those countries. I think that this is the key success. Of course, it didn't come without cost. And of course, some of the economies in our region suffered greatly from the 2008-2009 financial crisis. Nonetheless, 
If you look at the situation of today and compare it with the situation of 2004, you see that everybody got uh, uh, success. Everybody was able to catch up uh, with the most affluent economies uh, of, the, uh, of the western part of, uh, of the continent. Uh, I would regard this as the key success, therefore. And I think that the biggest success is that even though it is not 100% uh, that uh, a, la a large part of us, and especially the young people, have understood that and are a part of it and are able, unlike some of other generations, mine and older ones, in fact, uh, to be really very much not just integrated but involved. And I think that uh, it's not about what is the biggest success uh, of uh, enlargement 2004. We can say yes, bringing stability, security, safety, you know, enlarging internal market, investment, and so on. But the biggest issue is uh, what will be the success, what is yet ahead of us, and the ability to, in fact, uh, identify that and work on it together and make it happen. If I look back to the negotiation process, so was it very important that the new members, the negotiating new democracies, had to meet criteria. And for instance, criteria of meeting democracy values. And this was a strong criteria, even uh, towards minorities, to give minorities rights. Democracy is not just um, the imperial majority, minority in a democracy have rights. Uh, and many had to understand it. But we failed to understand that the European Union should establish mechanism to make strong these criteria, not just for candidates, but also for members. I have got some disappointment and, and some astonishment because I firmly believed in that, that European Union can keep Hungary on the right track related rule of law, democracy and human rights. Unfortunately, it did not come true. Many of us still believe that uh, a united Europe is the only future for all of us and Hungary and Poland and many other Central European countries can only find their place inside the European Union. So we are fighting continuously for a united Europe when all the member states are equal. But we also have supranational institutions of a united European structure. And we believe that this is the way out. The Europe we have been negotiating was Europe which over the years we didn't realize that it should have had more human face as uh, transformed into the Polish legislation and Polish social practice. Uh, the failure of European thinking, or of at least what we took for European thinking in Poland, was too much uh, space being given to the idea that you either swim or sink. And there were people who felt that they were left to fend for themselves too much by the state based on so-called Europeans, European ideas of free competition. The key failure, I think, uh, is our collective European inability to constrain uh, the uh, authoritarian populism, uh, to address uh, the issues uh, uh, which emerged uh, practically everywhere in Europe. The main thing in Europe uh, is mutual trust. It matters uh, if I know that I can trust you. Uh, if that trust disappears, then we are dealing with a transactional uh, um, situation where everybody is looking uh, after his or her own interest first and doesn't care much about the interests of the others. Uh, we need a community of values. We need a community based on trust. Uh, if we don't have that, then everything will go down. Uh, of course, not in a matter of one month or one year, but it will inevitably go down. So we must uh, find ways and means of dealing more effectively with uh, the authoritarian populism.
1989 and 2004 were very important moments in the history of modern Europe, and it is essential that every European citizen takes ownership of these events. Let all of us together draw from the lessons of 1989 and 2004 in order to better understand the Europe of today. A Europe in which the Central European countries have both a role to play, but also responsibilities. A Europe impacted by a pandemic and in which doubts about its future are growing. A Europe in which we are witnessing both attacks on its democratic principles and on its values. However, 1989 and 2004 have taught us one most important thing. If the citizens of a common Europe are willing to fight for their freedom and cooperate, we can guarantee that the Union will prevail.